Former leader of the Democratic Alliance, Tony Leon has released a new book called Future Tense, Reflections on My Troubled Land. We sat down with Tony for a long conversation around some of the themes in the book, and we are releasing a series of short clips of this conversation over the next few days or so. My name is David Ansara. Do stay tuned for more analysis. Tony, welcome to the CRA channel. What motivated you to write this book and, and what would you say is the essence of your latest publication? Well, my publisher, Jonathan Ball, approached me some time ago to do this book and I was a bit undecided about it. And he said, look, you know, you've been present and in the arena at so many critical moments, uh, the writing of the constitution, the affirmation of our bill of rights. And then as leader of the opposition, you mentioned when Mandela was president, I was head of the DP. When Mbeki was president, I was leader of the official opposition. I was uh, had a lot of encounters with Jacob Zuma, who strange enough may be an ambassador. And I also know Sir Ramaphosa. So those, and F.W. de Klerk also features in this book. So it's not just that I can comment on those events, but I was a participant in many of them. So I did have some insights, uh, which I thought might be worth uh, sharing with a wider public than the people who were aware of them. And then, of course, uh, the coronavirus struck and the lockdown happened a year ago, last March. So what was a sort of somewhat in, undecided on my part suddenly became a resolution that this would keep me sane every afternoon would be to write a thousand words and do the research on alternative days. And that's how the book built and grew and finally was published after many revisions. And I think one of the dilemmas that I wrestled with, which is actually answered in the book, is how do you write a book in such a fast changing world and country as South Africa and the world has been post uh, during this pandemic, which we're still in the middle of, and because events change, facts alter, uh, futures become very uncertain and unresolved. But when I thought about it, and I contemplate that in this book as well, there's actually nothing new under the sun, to quote King Solomon, because many of the personalities, the policies, the political missteps predate the onsets of the current crisis we're in from public health and financial point of view by years and often by decades. And too often, people, to use a famous Praveen Gordon line, don't join up the dots. They think, well, you know, this happened uh, because we have a very bad Minister of Social Development or a lousy police commissioner or because the Minister of Health was asleep at the switch uh, when vaccines were being procured by other countries. No, it actually all started a long time ago. And it's the consequence of ideological blindness in a way. And it's a policy of sticking to the carcass of dead policies in another way. So I chart some of that. And then I explain really through stories because I think everyone's interested in the story, David. They're not interested just in rafts of data, although there are over 450 footnotes in this book, and your institute provides very good data for quite a few of them, because people want to know, you know, give us the color of what it was like, who was in the room, what were some of the dilemmas people were grappling with, and having been old enough and ugly enough to have been in many of those rooms, I reflect on that as well. And then I guess finally, because you can't just say on the one hand this, on the other hand that, these are various scenarios, I do try and commit myself to what I think the future is going to look like, not that I have a crystal ball, not that you can say these things with predictive precision, but because if we continue on a certain road, we're going to land up at a destination which is rather dark, a cul-de-sac. If we chose choose another road not yet taken in this country, it could be a lot brighter. And I reflect on that as well. So Tony, you spend a lot of time analyzing the Ramaphosa administration and its track record the new dawn in 2018 was met with much fanfare and publicity, but the shine seems to have come off considerably. What do you think went wrong in the Ramaphosa administration? Obviously, you've mentioned COVID. That's a big exogenous variable. But what other factors were at play? Well, you know, the late great Chancellor of Germany, Helmut Schmidt, said, if you're having visions, go and see a doctor. Um, but in this book, I ask actually, what is Sir Ramaphosa's vision? He's a bit of this and a bit of that. He gets a lot of kudos from the business community, not for having created any new opportunities, but for having amassed a great deal of wealth through a range of policies of which he's been the most perhaps conspicuous beneficiary in this country. 
And so he's assumed to be pro-business, and yet he comes from a trade union background. He was one stage member of the Communist Party. And a lot of the policies that he's premised his presidency on have been populist and socialist. In fact, many of them have been borrowed directly from the EFF playbook. And then, of course, he's also hemmed in, and this is a point that's made by many people, by enormous internal constraints and divisions in his own party. But, you know, I, during one of Sura Ramaphosa's State of the Nation speeches two years ago, I happened to be in Westrom and Kent, where I was visiting the uh, country home of Winston Churchill at Chartwell action this day. And it occurred to me as Ramaphosa in, in that State of the Nation speech before we had the current crisis, but dealing with other crises, he dealt with every problem by appointing a committee or a commission. And that wasn't the Churchill way, even though he quoted Churchill in his speeches. And, you know, political leaders have to deal with divisions and with factionism. And I'm not saying that any two situations are parallel, but it's worth recording that Churchill, who had a real war to confront against the Nazis, was largely despised by the members of parliament of his own party who didn't want him to become prime minister. They wanted still Chamberlain or Halifax. And yet he plowed ahead. He had a, a vision of the case, which he prosecuted uh, with vigor and with some valiance. And, you know, we haven't seen that with Sir Ramaphosa. So I think there's a personal uh, amb ambivalence about him. I think there's a political weakness that we've seen evident. And then there's a great deal of policy confusion. Now, it is true. And one of the quotes I use in the book, one of the best, wasn't by me, but by the Brenthurst Foundation said, South Africa's policy rich and implementation poor. So even on the uncontested policy space, which there are a few examples in this country, there are uh, heralded announcements and no follow through. Well, the government has got something called Operation Vulandela. Let's see if that brings a change. Because frankly, uh, we've been avoiding the hard choices and the tough decisions for far too long. And the consequence of that avoidance is now on plain sight. We're on the eve of a debt trap. We've got a fiscal cliff that we really start to plunge over. And we've got a population that is not vaccinated, that is not at work, a great deal of them, and that is uh, very, very uh, fragile in terms of the so-called social compact that we thought we'd established in this country some decades back. So, Tony, you spend a lot of time reflecting on the national lockdown and the various uh, abuses of public trust, uh, infringements on basic civil liberties, and the concentration of power within the National Coronavirus Command Council. Uh, looking back, do you think that the government acted appropriately in the face of the COVID pandemic? Or do you think that irreparable harm has been done uh, to the economy and the body politic? Well, I, you know, without resorting to a cliche, I, I do not think we should underestimate the uh, resilience of the South African people and indeed the private sector. In fact, the, someone said your book's negative until the last five pages and the last five pages are positive about what I call to borrow George H.W. Bush's phrase, the thousand points of light, that you have this extraordinary broad array of civil service uh, or civil uh, organizations in South Africa from Afri Purim to the gift of the givers who repair the breach. You've got amazing depth in our private sector, despite being battered by uh, government legislation and deeply business unfriendly regulations. They still produce outsized performances in the most extraordinary sectors. And, you know, you, you have people who often without very much are prepared to do a great deal to help others. These are not inconsiderable gifts and endowments that the country has. But to the main point that you've asked, the government's uh, decision making, obviously, you've got to give the government, any government here or anywhere, some slack because they're dealing with a, a, an unknown pathogen. It is a novel coronavirus. You know a great deal about it a year later than we knew a year ago. And a lot of decisions were made based on imperfect information and with much urgency. So I think, you know, on that basis, one can't be too critical. Where you can be exceptionally critical, and I, am, I illustrate that in this book, is how almost the excuse of the national lockdown became the playground for state control freaks who decided that every problem was a nail and they had the state hammer and they would nail it down and 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 that's done huge damage you know and then while 
the Minister of Health was asleep at the switch on procuring vaccines, in contrast to many other countries, even poorer countries in Africa, the government was perfecting the one policy, despite all evidence of failure and despite its gross inapplicability to the health emergency, which was BEE, affirmative action, the things that really should have really been sent to the back row at a time of national crisis, which affected everyone, but in fact, it became about the only coherent thread in a great deal of the decisions. And then, of course, uh, David, in terms of accountability, we were almost back to the days of P.W. Butter, which I reflect in the book, the, he had a state security council, we had a national coronavirus council, and a command, let me give it full glorious title, command council, and decisions were made off-site. There was no scrutiny, there were no meetings of parliament, there was no answerability. And that, I think, leads to a lot of abuses, and we've seen a lot of those abuses. We've seen a great deal of corruption in a lot of the processes, which was of course, predated coronavirus, but accelerated during the pathogen. So Tony, in the book, you have a chapter called Men of Zeal, which deals with the ideological underpinnings of the ANC. And we've often on this channel spoken about the National Democratic Revolution, which is essentially a Marxist-Leninist philosophy, which was emerging in the 1960s, 1969, to be precise, at the Morogoro Conference mm. in Tanzania. Uh, what role do you think this kind of philosophy plays in terms of influencing the poli policy direction of the ANC government? Oh, I think it's front and center of everything the government does. And, you know, as, as I mentioned in the book, just to give it some, without saying I was right and, you know, others were wrong. But I point out, you know, that in, in 1997, when this policy was unfolded in public view, it's worth recalling that the ANC, to their credit, doesn't hide their light under some kind of bushel and then sneak up on you by surprise. It's all there in plain view, if you care to read it and join up the dots, to quote Praveen Gordon. And some of us read it, and some of us were deeply alarmed. And I, I recall that in 2001, at the Johannesburg Press Club, I went into bat against this policy. And, you know, the, everyone else was, not everyone, I think the Institute was very vigorous in its opposition, but most organizations, the entire apparatus of business, organized business in South Africa, the media particularly, uh, averted their gaze because they didn't want to interrupt what was an almost romantic account of how South Africa had transformed from an apartheid pariah to a brand new constitutional democracy, that it was doing well, relatively speaking, economically, that there was a spirit of reconciliation. Those were all good and great things. And I don't want to underestimate them or sideline them. But alongside this, even and especially during the benign Mandela era, this scaffold was being constructed, the NDR, that the state should control everything from universities to the Reserve Bank to SOEs, it's all in the document. And the author of that document, Joel Nechatensi, who is credited with being the reigning intellect in the ANC, or one of them, is today a main board director of Nedbank, which... Uh, you know, they must appoint whoever they want to direct. When you appoint some of those Marxist Lenin's views as a director, the, one of the leading private banks in South Africa, or public banks, you've got to say that this ideology, this hegemony, is now almost total. And there are a few corners of South Africa which it hasn't reached and which uh, the government would like to reach. And that's one of the reasons, incidentally, that the government launched such an assault on the DA in 2001 with Martinez van Skalkberg and others. So I don't underestimate the power of that ideology. And also I might say, and I do reflect on this in the book, of course they're the skimmers and the schemers and the grifters and the, the crooks who use that as, uh, as cover for their predatory practices. But there are quite a number of very sincere people who actually believe it. And they are the men of zeal. They are the people who actually, through the back door, as it were, uh, have brought to bear a range of policies and practice in our country, which have led us over the cliff. And unless and until those policies are reformulated, reconsidered, there's no way forward that I can see. Well, thanks very much, Tony. If you enjoyed this analysis, please do leave a like and comment on this video. Also check out the description below for a link to Tony's book. My name is David Ansara. This is the Center for Risk Analysis. Until next time, take care.